We got a great panel here. Uh, we're going to, uh, this is the commercial sector lab at the CalCab. Um, Mr. Max Martin of, uh, of Loving Texas is going to be the first one. He's a, uh, in addition with him, he's a data driven person, I can tell that. He runs about uh, 500 cows in New Charlottesville, and that's all I'm going to say because he has a great story. We're going to proceed with each of them giving an overview of their operation and the information and that, and then we'll come back and do questions and answers. Max? Some of my objectives in the last five years is to really try to understand all different faces of the cattle cycle, ensuring we can have profitability across this cycle, improving our margins, <coughs> better aligning our product and value chain, which we're still not quite aligned like I'd like it, and I'll talk to you about that. I've got two value chains. I've got the feedlot value chain that I sell into, <clears throat> and then the end consumer value chain. And I want more marketing options. We've achieved that. We sell in way and load right on the ranch, basically selling to two, two feedlots today. How I achieve that is we've got uh, a lead value add or cost of gain on our forage operation. So we keep our, our cost side in check with our forage operation and our cow efficiency, granularly putting nutrition on that trimester, whether that trimester that cow's in, and through breeding efficiency and handling our opens. And then on the revenue side, we basically use our health protocol for both risk protection and try to sell a value immunization plan on the calf, and then through bull genetics, and that's what I'll principally talk about this morning. We are a forage-based cow-calf stocker operation in Texas. We raise a terminal calf. So that's our business model with forage focus. We've got about 80% black Angus. Uh, the rest are black Baldies and red Angus. <coughs> All of our bulls are Charlotte, principally in the top third uh, percentiles through the spark. EBDs and all you have a little bit more detail. Principally, we're a calf stocker operator. Most of the time, we exit at the stocker phase. We will do some feedlot, either retain ownership or I will sell a partial interest in those uh, calves. We both spring and fall cattle, so we utilize our bulls twice a year. And we've got tillage, uh, triticale principally. We have the uh, fall, and then we have 21 species of cover crops in the summer <coughs> for those calves. Here's our weaning operation. Uh, all these calves will go into our pre-con feedlot at Albany. These particular calves here have uh, been sold to a feedlot for loading them out. That's my preference to sell them and weigh them right on the ranch the feedlot. This particular set of Cavs is a steady group. I had a guy in Oklahoma that I retained ownership. This is uh, last year's calves. I've got a group there today that I've got partial inter, uh, ownership in. So 50% to CRI, retained 50%. These calves will be marketed at U.S. Premium Beef, sold on the grid. <coughs> uh, Sally and Bill do all my blood work so I can do parentage, and I'll take that carcass, align them up with those bulls, and see if I'm on target or not. What I'm trying to do is produce a calf that will perform in the feedlot. So I want them uniform, we use a strict 60 day breeding season. I want good efficiency of data that we can produce and publish to those buyers. Uh, we want good immunization programs, and I want them to be able to perform on a grid. And I'm partially uh, happy with what we're doing today. I'll go through the mistakes we made, hopefully. You won't, uh, you won't have those mistakes in your operation. Here is my bull battery. <coughs> Down on the left hand side is all the identifiers. I principally use a yearling weight ribeye and marbling <coughs> with a prerequisite of caffeine, caffeine needs. As you can see, I started out first on the yield side, trying to get to the average of about 30%. I like that average for yearling weight. 
Uh, I don't want a big frame calf into the feedlot. I have you with, with that particular area. Although you can see I try to keep uh, some higher end bulls just to see if I got any opportunity uh, in those uh, areas. But I'm pretty happy with where I am on the growth side. <clears throat> ribeye, you've got a whopping ribeye today and at the 36% area. I'll share the day with you. Uh, we've also got some higher end percentile bulls there. Uh, but overall, uh, as Grandma said, <clears throat> be careful what you ask for because you might get it. And uh, some years ago, I said, well, we want a big ribeye. Uh, and now I got it, and now I got to figure out how to marble it. So, uh, we'll, we'll go through that <clears throat> now on marbling, that's my second phase, and that's the mistake I probably made starting that a little too late. You can principally see I've got three groups of bulls there. <clears throat> I've got some older bulls that are not very well marbled. I've got a group of bulls in the 40 to 60 percentile range. And my newer bulls are averaging about 16%, mainly because I don't quite know where I need to be on marbling. And I'm studying that with the group that I've got a CRI today, and then I've got another <coughs> group uh, coming afterwards. When you look over time, <coughs> this is basically a picture of when I bought those bulls and at what terminal sire index they are. So you can clearly see uh, the trend that I'm on on my bull purchases <clears throat> in the sense of my last book purchases were up around 205, 210 terminal index. So that has paid off for us. Those APDs have worked. I certainly achieved all the yield that I, that I need and now we're looking at refining that carcass. Now, what do you get for all that? Here's the results of several calf crops uh, combined and averaged together. <clears throat> we're happy with the yield, we're happy with the gains. I'm not so happy uh, with the choice to select the grade we have, and we're working on those areas today. Here they are for heifers, here they are for our steers. Uh, we've got a pretty good uh, dressing percentage, so overall I've been reasonably pleased uh, with those carcasses that we've been, uh, been selling. As Grandma said, on the ribeye, we got a lot of ribeye. But I may have painted myself into the box with that ribeye because our marbling scores on the low side are 400. We've got to get those up. Uh, on the top side, we ran 444. I'd like to get those into the 460, 470 uh, area if I could. <clears throat> so that's, that's the objective of where I'm headed. This will give you a reference database that I compare against. <clears throat> this is all the cattle that was shipped out of CRI feedlot in Diamond into the U.S. Premium B program in April and May, both steers and heifers. And on the lower side shows you how they marble. <clears throat> and it shows you the distribution right in there around 430 to 450. Here's how my calves compare. You can begin to see right here is a demarcation of how U.S. PB defines choice in this spread range here. <clears throat> CRI cattle, 67% were to the right of this mode. On my cattle, only 22%. So I really started marbling too late in that program, and that's the focus that I got on it now. Now, <clears throat> to the economics, <clears throat> But how I buy bulls, and this will uh, show you my perspective from a seed stock point of view on how I come prepared to your sales. I principally have got to have a calving ease, weak pasture calves, so we've got big pastures, so I can't be watching them, so I have to have that. But I principally look at yearly weight and ribeye and marbling, uh, and not so much uh, TSI, although TSI is a good summary. And then, of course, here's the other characteristics that I buy. And David, you can see I stole your, your description of side butt there. I love that. <laughs> David was describing a bull in the sale recently, and he said, boy, look at that side butt. I, thought, I never heard that term. I like that. But that's how I buy bulls, <clears throat> those characteristics. As I said, on yearling weight, I'm on target. I don't want a bigger frame calf into that feedlot. I'm very happy with 30, 
uh, percentile cap. Ribeye may, may have overdone that. <clears throat> I may back down a little bit on that ribeye. Maybe I'll back myself into a corner with that big ribeye, 17 square inches, <clears throat> because I may be having a little trouble getting any marble. Average in marble now is about a 423. Like I said, I'd like to get out to that up to 460 if I could. And I'm studying where I need my bulls to be on marbling. <clears throat> I've got two groups, uh, and there's in the study group now, it's about 30 40 percent percentile a marble bull, but I'm studying to see what that result's going to be. And I'm ready with a, another uh, group of calves next that are about 16 percent marble. And I'm kind of thinking that that's where I need to be. Here's how I buy a bull economically. <coughs> I breed two times a year, so I use a bull four months out of 12. So per year, you can see the number of calves or cows that I breed, assuming it's a five-year life. So I get, uh, as far as dollars go, I get about a quarter million dollars out of a bull from a revenue point of view. U.S. premium statistics at premium beef quote about 4% premium. I've said I'll target 3.5% premium. If I can get a lift of 3.5%, that gives me an extra lift of nine grand on that bull. So I'm saying if I take 25% of that nine grand and put it back on the price of that bull and pocket the rest of that, that gives me an additional $150,000 of ranch profit. So I take that $2,300 and instead of using the traditional rule of thumb of buying a bull, I kind of look at the average. I add that $2,300. So this year I went to bull sales with $6,300 my pocket raised spend. Turns out I bought six bulls at $6,100 and happy with the EPDs. So that's how I try to allocate my dollars on what I'm willing to pay for a bull. We've still got a lot of opportunities, but we've still got a lot of challenges that we haven't conquered. <clears throat> the choice select spread last year ranged from one dollar to thirty-two dollars. We do we don't do a good enough job of trying to time that calf on that choice select spread. And of course, we had a lot of trade-offs, a lot of moving parts, with our forage not being ready, coming out of our pre-con yards. We need to breed that calf. We need to breed that cow. Uh, so we've got a timing issue uh, there that I'd like to improve. Overall, I have an objective to better align our calf quality with the overall value of the market. I happen to believe that we've got good domestic demand for quality. We're going to get better uh, international man demand for quality beef. So I'm going to be better aligned to that quality uh, so that I can take advantage of those choice select spreads. We've got a rigorous data gathering and record keeping system. I publish all that to my buyers. I publish my immunization program, when that calf was vaccinated, how it was vaccinated, <coughs> what it was vaccinated with. Uh, we have our own scales on ranch. We measure random sample, daily gains. We publish all that data. I publish all my feedlot data to my buyers. Uh, and. Uh, the, the reputation <coughs> that we have for deaths, for example, in feedlots is, uh, is remarkable from our immunization management program. One of the things that I have not done <coughs> is looked at any kind of identity from our replacement efforts. I was talking to Bill and Sally last night, and uh, I'm hoping they can help me get better educated on what options I have to do that. They'll raise my own efforts because I'm a terminal. And we don't necessarily do a good job of when I get into the feedlot, when I get out, because on one side I got the choice select spread, on the other side I got my cost of forage, and I'm a little selfish because I run, I try to run about 40 cents cost of gain on forage, about 67 percent cost of gain in my pre on the feedlot, and of course I'm way on up into 70, 75 cents when I go to CRI. <coughs> Uh, feedlots. I'm a little selfish trying to uh, put weight on that, uh, that cow before I, uh, calf before I put it in the feedlot. And then when do I take it out of that feedlot, try to optimize 
the carcass and hit that choice select spread. So we've got a little bit of work to do in those particular areas. This will give you a little bit of idea of what that choice select spread has looked like from the seasonality of Waterview from 2007 to 2016. And you can see there's some wild swings in there. And if you happen to hit those highs or lows, it can make a big impact on that uh, revenue. There's another uh, view of it that's showing your range. <coughs> and you have another uh, view of it uh, over the 12 months period of time. So you can, uh, you can make a big, big impact by, uh, by timing, uh, but it gets complicated. <coughs> When we look at the overall demand curve, we've got a tremendous improvement in the demand for quality beef in the 2009 to 2014 uh, area. It's currently uh, slowed off just a little bit, uh, but clearly records show that barbling is the contribution as far as eating quality that the consumer uh, wants, and that we have a basic number one problem is, is barbling, and I'm trying to see if I can have both yield as well as quality. As far as what I've learned, uh, I wish I would have aligned to both value curves and chains earlier on because I was trying to satisfy the feedlot with good gain data. I've done that, <clears throat> but I want that feedlot to sell that cow, that, cow on a, that calf on a grid, so I've got to be a little bit better prepared to show that uh, feedlot performance from a grid point of view. I've used EPDs, as I said, for 15 years as a very effective tool. There's a lot of trade-offs that we've got. For example, on one hand, I want a lot of marbling. On the other hand, I use two growth promotants, and I've got a lot of forage, so I've got a lot of vitamin A. Vitamin A is not a producer of marbling. So there's a tremendous amount of trade-offs that we're trying to get educated on and to deal with. And of course, the first time I got a grid discount, I almost cried, and then I figured out that's not a bad thing. You just got to have a good offset uh, with the premium side. And of course, we've obviously got a very pounds biased market, so I'm not willing to sacrifice uh, pounds. And uh, we, about five years ago, we, we also went to no-till uh, and uh, summer cover crops. And my, one of my neighbors asked me, said, would you like it? And I said, yes, I'm not going back uh, to conventional village. Yeah, I feel the same way about EBDs. Uh, they're a little complicated. You've got to have great records. Uh, you've got to have integrity in your, in your relationship with those feedlots. Uh, but if you publish that, and I have for 15 years, uh, I basically sell my cattle on the telephone now <clears throat> with one feedlot. And they do the solving, or they call it sorting. With the other feedlot, I do it with the understanding that if they don't like it, they send that cat to a little sale barn, they'll make check. So uh, it pays to have a reputation backed by good EPD data. I want to thank the folks who uh, helped with this presentation and, and shared uh, their uh, data today with me as well. And thank you uh, for your time. And now we'll let the rest of the panel give you their stories. Great job. If I doesn't uh, listen to some questions down there, I don't know what you do down there. So appreciate that very much. Our next presenter is uh, Baron Kidd. He's from Dallas, Texas. I know that he uh, runs a bunch of black cows and runs uh, white bulls on them. So, Baron, we'll let you uh, have it. Thank you very much. Max, uh, I, I just got an education. That was terrific. Well, don't believe it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 3,300 acres. We're 50 miles south of Dallas. Uh, we run 265 cows. We used to run 300 and something cows. Uh, but we had a drought a few years ago. And uh, I decided that uh, I wasn't going to sell cows my feed because the cows just end up eating themselves and do something like that. So I sold out hard and uh, we're just rebuilding. And I think probably we're going to go to 300 cows eventually. 
but I'm in no hurry to get there. Uh, because of Robert Wells, uh, I bought two Charlet Bulls about five or six years ago. Robert, is that right? And we now have 13 bulls, and 10 of them are Charlotte. So we've increased our winning weight by almost 100 pounds. And uh, that's in spite of the fact that I like to buy low birth weight bulls. That's my first criteria. Then everything else falls into shape. But uh, I bought a bull last January, and the bull birth weight was 71 pounds. His weaning weight was 796, and his yearling weight was 1351. Now, I know that bull was fed a lot, but it still is amazing to me that you could have an animal even if you feed it, do that. That's amazing. So I thank the Charlotte people for doing that. Uh, we had, uh, at, at one time, uh, I bought, I went to South Dakota and bought some bulls that are called, that are called uh, uh, continental bulls, maybe. And uh, they were huge. The calves were enormous. And I lost three calves that year because they, and we had 100 pound, 100 pound calves. It was ridiculous. I decided never to do that again. That's why I went to the low birth weight world. Um, I really don't have much else to say. Thank you. Well, we'll get some questions back uh, so, for you in a minute. Thank you very much for. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Rusty Daniel comes from Coma, Oklahoma. Uh, he is uh, there at Wood Ranch. They use Charlet bulls on black cows, and I understand you uh, keep those calves for yearlings, so let's uh, hear what Rusty's going to tell us. Oh, I forgot to say, we keep the calves until yearlings. Mm -hmm. We keep them on pastures. Well, my, I'm gonna, mine's a little bit unique perspective than these other two gentlemen. I don't own the, the ranch that I uh, work on. I went to work for Mr. Wood in uh, September of 05 and he had a bunch of grass and uh, 2,500, 3,000 acres and wanted to find a way to utilize it and uh, we got together and, and I, I started to work for him. He had already had a bunch of cows when I went to work for him but we had it, uh, he had a couple hundred I guess. We got it to I guess 600 before the, the drought but I had, I kind of have a unique uh, perspective from the, from my past experiences and some of you guys have heard this story before, but my first uh, recollection of Charlay was awful. When I was, uh, I guess, uh, eight or nine years old, maybe, I don't remember the exact time, but my granddad kind of used me and my cousin as uh, uh, free help. And uh, he, would, he would bait us into that by giving us a cow or something and, and saying, you know, you take, you help me feed and, and do all the things we need to do and, and we'll sell a calf. And, he, I always thought he was kind of an innovator, and he came home with a couple of white bulls, uh, mid '70s, and and uh, both me and my cousin's uh, cow got bred to these white bulls, and uh, nine months later they were both dead. And uh, I grew to loathe Charlay, and uh, I guess in uh, we've always dealt with Noble, and after I had gone to work for Mr. Wood for year or so we wanted to find a way to capture uh, this for what we were doing the same inputs with we wanted to hit he used Angus and uh, nothing against Angus bulls we come from the area that we're Wapanuck is actually where the ranch is there's an Angus breeder on every section 
You can buy an Angus bull. You can buy ten of them before dark and, and not uh, and, and, and use an earshot. But uh, Evan Whitley was a guy here at Noble, and uh, if I say Noble Foundation, I don't mean that's just a slip of the tongue. It's, uh, we've used them for 40 years, and uh, it's hard to break that habit. But anyway, we uh, Evan Whitley convinced us to uh, to buy some Charlay bulls, and I had, my dad and I had, had used a few Charlay along. And it got along pretty good, but I still have those memories of seeing my cow out there dead and you know, a jeep tied to one end and her tied to a tree trying to get a calf out of her. And uh, I was still a little bit leery, but I went from total uh, detest but then, you know, over the period of time to after just a year or two. And by the way, we're also integrity beef. We follow the protocol. We haven't always sold in the sale, but we follow the protocol. And I went from literally just disgust at Charlay to within just a few years, that's the only bulls we have. My dad, that's the only bulls he has. And, uh, you know, I have seen over, over the time the genetics change from, from uh, and I, I'm not saying that all Charlay bulls were cow killers in 1975, I'm not saying that. The two I happen to be dealt, happen to deal with work. But we've gone from, from, uh, I wouldn't put them on the, the biggest Brahma cow you could find. We even breed them to heifers now. And uh, the, the, the rationale behind that is if I have the same amount of inputs on a 1,200 pound cow, she's, she's going to eat the same amount. She, I'm going to have the same amount of fertilizer, the same amount of feed. I may as well get that extra 50 or 60 pounds. It's free. And, and, and my, the guy that I work for is all about pushing revenue. And uh, we have proven, and I don't have any slides, and I apologize for that. First of all, I'd had to have somebody from Noah come over and help me do it. Uh, come to Coleman or walking up and help me do it, because I, I still have a, I have practically a rotary cell phone. <laughs> we, that, 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 that extra genetic uh, merit is not only worth uh, 50 or 60 pounds, where I, I know back, uh, I've got, got a good relationship with a couple of uh, of calf buyers, you know, the, that smutty, whatever, sh smoky, charlay calf used to not be nearly as appealing to them as it is today. And we can sell our, we've, we fed them. Uh, in fact, I've got the, uh, the last pen of cattle we fed would have been about 11 or 12. We fed 300 calves, steers and heifers. And they were 70% yield grade ones and twos, 70% choice. Uh, all of them uh, uh, one to five uh, conversion, and you're not going to find that in anything. I mean, that's as good as it gets. And and we've gone from uh, weaning a calf that weighed 450 in 2005. If we don't wean one that weighs 600 pounds now, there's probably something environmentally wrong. We didn't have enough rain or whatever. We'll, we'll our weaning weights will always be seven. We'll put if we don't put two on them in that 60 to 90 day uh, uh, background, then something's wrong. We'll, we'll always put, I'm gonna say two and a quarter, two and a half. And like I said, my guy likes to push. And we'll feed them, we'll, we'll, we'll wean them, and uh, they'll be born from the 20th of January through the 10th of March. We'll wean them in right now. Uh, to, we've got so much grass, it's hard to wean them. Think about weaning them now, but we'll, we'll start weaning soon. And uh, we'll always wean, like I said, six weight calf, and, and we'll get them to eight before Christmas. And we'll sell them uh, at about 850, 900 pounds. We have sold, we marketed through Cargill, uh, where they would just come to us. And they still call every year. Sometimes we can't match up. Uh, we've sold to um, Cactus. Uh, we sometimes, you know, just trying to get together over a penny or two is, is, is sometimes a, an issue, but, but we've sold them at, at El Reno, we've sold them in Oklahoma City. Uh, we've never hedged them. I, I think that there's opportunity there, especially when you've got a good calf like we have. Uh, I think there's opportunity there. We've never uh, I've done that because my guy's kind of a uh, fly by the seat of his britches and this is on video and uh, we may have to edit that. <laughs> 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 but, uh, I, I think
think that there's opportunity. When you know what you've got, we've got about, we'll have between, at any one time, we'll have 425, 450 cows. And I know what she's going to, I know what the bull's going to do. We, we use the protocol of uh, I beef, so we're top 20, yearling weight, weaning weight, but I also uh, put a lot of emphasis like, uh, Mr. Martin was talking about on, on those uh, on that ribeye. I don't want a gigantic one. I, I, we're shooting for about 14, and I'm looking for something. Uh, uh, put a lot of emphasis on uh, on marbling and all those uh, carcass traits because he, whether I feed them, or you feed them, or somebody else feed them, somebody's ultimately going to feed them and kill them, and that's important. And it's important. I've had guys that we've sold to, and even at Oklahoma City, that I, I'll, I'll send my name and number with that. Uh, we bill them in and I'll get calls back from those guys and they'll say hey whatever you're doing keep it up and I'll say well if it's that good you call me next year and offer me a you know premium you can have them again and but it's important to them and they want to know how, how that how, how we take care of them uh, those things are awfully important but I guess if there's one thing that I would want you to, to get out of this being this, this is Charlay meeting uh, especially with my background I never dreamed that I'd say this. I probably, uh, other than owning a, a, an Angus, Black Angus, or Red Angus, maybe to keep some, some heifers out of because we're, we're terminal. I don't know that I'll ever own anything from a black, I mean, uh, that a white bull. And even my dad, who has, uh, my, my dad likes, he, he keeps a lot of Charlotte cows. There's nothing wrong. They may get a little bit big, and if there's one thing I could say, uh, I, I if you find that kind of a middle of the road five and a half frame score bull, uh, there's nothing wrong with keeping a white Charlotte female. Uh, my dad's got lots of them. And uh, there's nothing wrong with those girls. And so, you know, just because we uh, talk about terminal, they have other uses in the, in the industry. They're not just something that, we're, you know, we're looking to cut their head off. Uh, and the only, only white females you're going to see is on a seed stock producer. They make really good cows also. But, uh, I want you to take that also from, from, from what we've done. Wood Ranch, if you came out there today, the only thing white you're going to see is the, is the bulls and the, and the calves, but the cows also have some merit. Anyway, thank you very much. Good job. All right, this is the fun part. Uh, questions? It's always good for somebody to be first. Okay, I'll be first. Max, uh, and on your, uh, I think it's interesting that you've identified uh, the female side there particularly that you're going to work on. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I know you've been buying uh, your heifers from one supplier. Uh, uh, you have uh, some idea uh, what direction you're going to go or I know you always get new information. Well, most of the, uh, I buy my heifers uh, out of Lahontie, Colorado, uh, because I've got a relationship with a good uh, buyer there that I've known for years. Uh, typically, I buy a late stage break check uh, AI brand, uh, either a black or red uh, heifer. Um, but I don't know anything about the sire, I don't know anything about the heifer. Uh, for example, he, I, I, I need to. I need two loads of heifers right now. And he called me the other day and said, hey, I've got them uh, for $1,750. Uh, and I said, no, I don't think that's going to work for me. Uh, and, I, and these are heifers I don't know anything about. So I've got to somehow figure out how to get smart uh, on a heifer that, I, you know, that belongs to a fellow that I don't know to how to go get information about who that sire is and more information uh, about, uh, about that heifer whether or not uh, I want her on board or not uh, with, with the program that, that, I, that I've got. Uh, and I'm just, quite frankly, I'm too ignorant to, to pull it off and uh, I'm going to call Bill and Sally tomorrow and have them figure it out for me. Just <laughs> pass that on down to uh, Dusty. Uh, you got enough cord there? Sure. Yeah, you're good. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing on uh, your replacement? Are you raising uh, most of yours? Well, we, we, we have started doing that in the last few years, but before that, we would just kind of farm them out to somebody that we had some knowledge of how they did things. We always wanted them AI. And we, I don't know that we've had a, a heifer, I mean, or a cow in our in our uh, operation that hasn't been settled AI. Uh, 
there may have been a few that, that, that the cleanup will have got, but, but that's something that I, I really pay attention to. I want one that's bred, like if we're doing it the 1st of May, and she doesn't breed in 30 days, because I, I want that reproductive uh, trait in the cow herd. If she breeds early as a heifer, that doesn't necessarily mean she will as a cow. I understand all that, but it increases my odds. And I was very interested in the in the in the talk that that uh, can't remember the names, but um, anyway, that they gave about the, that. That's something that I would like to see uh, developed is, uh, is is to shoot for that for that heifer that will breed early. And if there's any, I don't know anything about the genetics, but if there's any way we could track that, uh, just you know, and increase our odds of getting her bred quick. Great. And uh, you're uh, increasing, moving back your herd, and where's your uh, females coming from on that? We're buying them. Uh, we've, I've, I've got one guy that I have relied on for the last. Uh, Five or six years to uh, and uh, you buy them from two different places, and uh, I know the I know the herds they're coming from. So uh, we're probably paying a little bit too much for them, but uh, they they've been good to me so far. So this work. Thank you. Question in the back back there. Go ahead. Hey, Jim and. Uh, in light this on how long do you feel like a survey will last in your program? How long do you keep a survey bull? So the question is how long uh, are you figuring on Charlotte bulls to last? Uh, as long as they don't break anything. <laughs> uh, we've had them for uh, four or five years. Uh, but we've also had had, uh, I bought a I bought a bull uh, two years ago and uh, had a problem with it, uh, so I had to get, get rid of it. But otherwise, we've been we've been happy with them. So. I, I test every usage, and we use them twice a year. I've got I've got one bull now, seven years old. Uh, I generally will pair him, make sure from a risk point of view that he's got other bulls with him. Uh, so, that, so that we, you know, have to go bad during the breeding season. I don't come up uh, short-handed, uh, but if he's good and sound, uh, I've got some larger pastures. We try to put the older bulls in some smaller pastures, so that they don't have to work uh, quite quite as hard. Economically, as the slide indicated, uh, I used to al I allocate about five years on the economic side, uh, and I've really I've only lost. Uh, uh, I guess two bulls from a soundness point of view. One I had a front end go go bad, and the other had a testicle drop. We got a lot of cactus, so I don't like that. So we can shape on that. I think in the 11 years that we've had Charlotte bulls, the the only thing that we have sold one for structurally was uh, foot issues. I don't know that we've ever, I guess we have had one or maybe two that, that were, were not uh, fertility, at the, at the soundness exam where the fertility wasn't good enough, but I've got, we've got a couple of bulls that are, that are eight years old, like we've got three that are eight years old, and I, if, uh, I'm kind of like Mr. Martin, I, we, we'll kind of group them, if, uh, if I've got, I've got two or three of those three bulls that are, that are eight, we'll just kind of put them with uh, bulls of similar size uh, that that are a little bit younger, and we don't have we don't have any issues. A, a lot of times, you know, people say sell them when they get a certain age, but I don't know why you would if they're still sound. Dusty, uh, just break back this way. By young uh, yearling bulls, how do you manage those with the you know, We uh, try, we got three set. have got three different pasture uh, rotations. And we'll, I, I, I like to keep the smaller bulls, if I can, together, uh, to, just to keep one bull from totally dominating. Uh, but we'll, we'll have uh, a bull to 25 to 30 cows on a 60 to 75 day breed. And 
I try to match them up mainly by, by size. Uh, but you know, sometimes you got to put the younger bulls, like Mr. Mark saying, in the bigger bigger pasture so they can cover more ground. I use 25 cal ratio uh, for a bull that's 20 months or older. Below that, I typically try to keep it around 10, 12, 15, uh, no more than that. We, um, we use about 25 cows per, per bull, and uh, we actually have held back the, uh, the, young, the young bulls that we bought, uh, and uh, uh, we might might put them with, uh, might put a couple of these yearling bulls with 30 or 40 cows in a small pasture and uh, let them do it. But that's, that's about, we, we don't, we don't work the yearling bulls very hard. Thank you. Another question. Right here. Um. We've heard all the good things about Charlotte Bulls. What are some areas of improvement that you'd like to see or that we need to work on? Question is, there is improvement we need to work on for Charlotte Bulls. Three things. Marbling. Marbling. <laughs> well, we, did, we didn't have such a marbling issue. Maybe that was because of our Angus, uh, the cows. But... Uh, the only, the only issues that we've had, and I guess we've had 30 or 40, 50 over the years, is some, some foot issues, uh, especially rear feet and, and those uh, do claws, uh, not the claws, uh, the hooves growing out a little bit, and, and not because of, of a grain issue. I don't know, I, I'm not a vet, so I couldn't speak to that, but... Uh, we really I haven't had a whole lot of issues other than you know four or five or six that fell out because of, of foot issues and uh, you know it, that, that's about the only thing I can think of that, you know I've had one for this or one for that but, but the, the only thing that stands out to me is the feet uh, the only problem we've had uh, uh, one uh, one bull broke something and uh, we've had two other other bulls that had foot issues, uh, and also rear feet uh, issues. But that's that's it. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. You were talking about your dad keeping some Charlotte cross females and things. Have you had any of them long enough to see how your average age on those? Do you see that longevity in those females as you are your bulls? Well, now. I'm, I'm also kind of the same way about a cow that I am a bull. If there's nothing wrong with her, and she's still got teeth, and we'll keep them forever, <laughs> and uh, as long as she breeds and raises a decent cat, I guess I keep adding to that. But uh, I think he's got he's got a set of about 15 that are got to be 10 plus, and I know a lot of people when they hit double digits is down the road. We're not one of those, and that could be to our detriment, but 10 plus, they're still in there, still raising a good kid, still sound uttered, which is another thing that I think Charlotte has done a lot to, to improve, because they used to you know, kind of look like a Hereford. Uh, I, maybe a Hereford guy in here, but uh, you know, <laughs> they, 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 uh, they really have a lot to improve that. Thank you. Take one more question for this uh, panel. Mr. Martin, are you, you said your parentage testing your calves. That, did you understand it correctly? Both of calves? Yeah, Sally and Bill take the blood. Uh, I have the feedlots mm -hmm. uh, do the blood. Sally sends them the blood card. They send it back to Sally, and I do the bulls, and then she matches it up for me. Sorry. And, uh, Using that later on in your bull selection later on to find. Well, then I get that uh, carcass data from U.S. Premium mm -hmm. Beef. So then I'll match that carcass data from U.S. Premium Beef to that sire and see if I'm getting what I think I'm supposed to be mm -hmm. getting. And then, as I indicated, you know, where I want to say, because when I started out, you know, I said, oh, let's just maximize everything. Well, it's not a maximization game, it's an optimization game. 
and we got a lot of different moving parts. And like I say, if I had it to do over, you know, maybe I maybe I don't like the ribeye I got after all. You know, so maybe I I should have been a little bit more granular on selecting those. And that's what I try to do is select the top my top half. You can see my bottom half marbling right now is pretty bad. Uh, and I try to hook that up with, with that carcass data and determine whether I like that bull or not in the herd. Great job. Let's give this panel a hand. What a great panel.